is I need to take this compass that God has provided in the Ten Commandments, I need to find out what his standard is, find out me, and go, well, Brian, you're just building your own reputation, your own worth. Stop, repent, say, God, I am sorry. I need your strength to go your way. All right, we've been following the Israelites as Moses leads them out of Egypt and they have arrived at this mountain, which we have our special effects here to just try to capture what's exactly going on here. We've reached chapter 20. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Exodus chapter 20. We've reached the climactic moment of the book of Exodus. It's not the Yom Suf, not the crossing of the sea, but it's when they reach this mountain. And in fact, this mountain, we've really come to discover that this is likely the actual mountain in Saudi Arabia. Um, it's covered at the top. Just the top is covered in black soot from fire. Uh, not from a volcano though, this is ancient soot. This is actually where the Lord descended in fire upon this mountain. And you could hear that trumpet we read a few weeks ago about the shofar, the ram's horn blowing. It wasn't blown by human, but instead from heaven. And that was the signal for Israel as a people, as a nation, to approach this mountain. It said they were terrified. I would too. And they would approach it because they are going to be meeting with God. They are actually going to hear the Lord's voice for themselves. And so that's where we've been. Is last week they actually heard the voice of God speak. And what God is giving them is this. It's a compass. It's a compass by which to make decisions. It's a moral compass, and it's just like a regular compass. And we talked about how last week, most people today don't know how a compass works. There's actually two arrows. And, and most people today, because we live in the digital age, we just know a compass points north. That's all we really know. But actually, how to use one, a, an analog compass, it, it works like this, where the red end of the needle is magnetized, and it always points to magnetic north. So if you're in the wilderness and you're trying to find your way, it points north. But there's, and, and we've talked about this compass that God is giving to the people of Israel called the Ten Commandments. It always points not to north. It always points to God's standard. That doesn't change. It's always the same because God doesn't change. But there's a second arrow that does change. And every compass will have this. It's your heading. On this compass, it, it spins round. And you can see that we've labeled it on this moral compass a heart because it's the needle of your heading, what you desire, what your heart wants. And so last week, we, we, we introduced the first heading on the compass, which is the first commandment, which, which is no other God. No other God before Yahweh. And, and, and as you look at this, we, we take a heading and we see that the, the God's standard is no other gods. But we often drift and we start following after other things to satisfy us or fill us or give us life. So what we need to do is we need to check our heading. And if we're heading in the wrong direction, what we need to do is, is pause and say, what is God's standard? God's standard says no other gods. And what we need to do is adjust our heading and go in his direction. That's how the Ten Commandments work. The second one we looked at last week was very similar. No idol idolatry. Built upon the first. And we talked about idols the modern word for idols, we think, oh, we don't have idol worship today. Yeah, right. The modern word for idol is addiction. Things we're dependent upon. And, and last week we talked about smartphones and the addiction to smartphones. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Netflix, alcohol, drugs, Anything we're looking to for life or satisfaction. And so we have to look at this and say, you know, has my smartphone become an idol in my life that I'm addicted to? First thing I do in the morning is check my iPhone. Last thing I do before I go to sleep is my iPhone. Or the first thing I do is check Instagram. 
or TikTok, whatever it is. And we say, if this has become an idol in my life, I need to adjust my heading and go towards God's standard. Last week, I challenged y'all. Did any of you put down your phone for the week? There's a hand. I see a couple hands. It's awesome. Because as it becomes an idol, as it becomes an addiction, what's God's standard? That we find our life and worth in him. And we need to adjust our heading and head his direction. Well, we're going to head to the, the next two out of ten uh, commandments today. And again, there are headings. And this is what we're going to learn from this today. As we go into to the, the, these other commandments. Is we need to, and this is huge in our walks with the Lord, as we're trying to seek the Lord, seek his voice, is to regularly recalibrate your heading. And this isn't a day-by-day thing. This is an hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute checking what's our heading and what's God's standard. But let's pray before we dig in. God, as we come here, I praise you for the sweet worship Lord, you, I know you were speaking to me in that last song, and, and we, were, we were praising you. We were singing with one voice before your throne, praying in one voice through the lyrics of that song. You are good, God. You're never going to let us go. Those are promises, Lord, that you have given through your word, and we sing it back to you. God, would you speak, continue to speak your promises to every person in this room? that we'd be blown away by your presence this morning, that you would build your kingdom here in our lives. And that doesn't happen through an eloquent speech or superior wisdom, but only through a demonstration of your Holy Spirit's power so that our faith doesn't rest upon man or man's ideas, but instead upon God's power. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, Exodus chapter 20, verse, actually we're going to be in verse 7, left off at 6 last week. So here's verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of Yahweh. Again, Yahweh is God's primary name. Our English Bible translates the name Yahweh as the Lord. You shall not misuse the name of Yahweh, your God. For Yahweh will not hold anyone guiltless his, who misuses his name. And, you know, as you look at this, You know, the first one was real clear. No other gods before me. No idols. And this third one, do not misuse the name of the Lord. The old King James was, do not take the, you know, thou shall not use thy name in vain. Empty. And and the most common way that we apply this to our lives is when it comes to our language. And it's so ironic that the name of God or the name of Jesus Christ can be used as profanity. Do you, have you ever thought about how ridiculous that is? It's interesting. You know, the reason people use profanity or cuss is because those words, all of the cuss words, they, are, they have power. It's like to emphasize our emotion, our anger. It's interesting, you know, just even over the past couple of years, have you noticed how much worse everybody's language has gotten? It's getting worse and worse. If you believe in evolution, you're a dork. Everything devolves. It doesn't evolve. Second law of thermal, no, third law of thermodynamics. Second, thank you when I go off notes I forget and it's just interesting language is just devolving but somehow the name of God or Jesus Christ the reason that even atheists will use God's name or use Jesus' name as a cuss word is because it's different the name of Jesus is different it's powerful And so using the name of Jesus to emphasize their point, emphasize their anger, emphasize their point of view. And and it's like, yeah, that's here. And and don't misunderstand me. That is part of the third commandment here is don't misuse the name of the Lord. And and just, I don't want to talk too much about it because this is where we primarily see this in this commandment. But if you find yourself being cheap and 
kind of freely using the name of God or Jesus? Well, God's standard is don't misuse the name of the Lord. So what you need to do is turn your heading. You know what that's called in scripture? Repenting. Repenting just simply means do a 180. Just turn and go towards God's standard. And I'm just going to tell you this. If you want to do that, don't do it by willpower. You will fail. But say, hey, God, it's like cigarettes, giving up, saying, using God's name as a cuss word, or Jesus. You say, hey, God, I don't have enough strength to not do that. Please forgive me. He does. And give me the power not to do it again. He will answer that prayer. You're probably going to have to pray it a lot because it's like, it's an addiction. Language is addicting. But I don't want to talk about that too much because I think there's a much deeper application that's far more common than using God's name as a cuss word. And we know how common that is. But there's another element to this that, quite frankly, we don't talk about enough. It's a more common, more dangerous, and deeper application of this third commandment not to misuse the name of the Lord. It's appropriating God's name for your own purpose. To build your reputation, your name, your kingdom. And I just have to say, some of the most evil events in the history of the world have taken place when people were misusing the name of God. Events like this. War. Do you know how many wars have been fought in the name of God? A classic example would be the Crusades, but that is not the only one. And if you look back over history, in the way when churches get political or with when kings have risen up and wanted to expand territory and they'll use the name of God, they'll paint the cross on their shields. They use the name of God for their own selfish purposes and it has nothing to do with honoring God. It's about building their own kingdoms. The most obvious example of this was this guy. This is Hitler shaking hands with the pastors of the German church and a Catholic cardinal. You know, you look at Hitler... Early on, he claimed to be building a Christian empire. Did you know that? Now, privately, he despised Christians, true Christians. Despised them venomously. But publicly, said all the right things because he was using it to unite people behind his agenda. He was misusing the name of God. In fact, Hitler, he used Christians in Germany who weren't discerning enough to realize what was really going on. A few did, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Most of them didn't. It wasn't until later that we found out things that he said like this. Look at this. He was using Christianity because that was the religion. And he could use that religion to unify people behind his agenda. And he regretted it was Christianity. Look at what he says here. It has been our misfortune to have the wrong religion. He's talking about in Germany. Wish it wasn't Christianity is what he's basically saying. Why did we have the religion why didn't we have the religion of the Japanese who regard sacrifice for the fatherland as the highest good the Mohammedan religion Islam too would have been much more comp- compatible to us than Christianity why did it have to be Christianity with all this meekness and flabbiness Because he knew he could use God to unify people behind his agenda. And when when we read this, this passage, the third commandment that says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord, Yahweh, that's exactly what he did. This commandment is far deeper than profanity. 
And you read this, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord for your, uh, your God, for Yahweh will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Hitler has to face or had to face the justice of God for misusing. You talk about evil. Misusing the name of God, using writings from Martin Luther later on in his life when he was dealing with sinality, when he started writing very anti-Semitic things, and Hitler used those and would twist them into manipulating Christians into following him. That is flat evil. He's building his own little kingdom. But you know what? Israel has done the same thing. Israel's so careful with the third commandment. You know, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord. You shall not use my name in vain. That ancient Judaism and still some Orthodox Jews today refuse to write the name Yahweh out of reverence, but also because they don't want to write the name Yahweh and have that piece of paper accidentally burn. And then all of a sudden the name of Yahweh would be vain or void. So careful with not, you know, thinking of this more as a, you know, in the sense that we would as profanity. It's deeper than that, that they don't realize how they misuse the name of the Lord. We can read about it. Keep your thumb or finger in Exodus chapter 20 and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4. A very clear example of misusing the name of the Lord for your own purposes, to build your own little kingdom. First Samuel chapter 4, this is um, after Eli and, and his sons, they're there, and this is before King Saul came on scene, and they were battling against the Philistines. So First Samuel chapter 4, verse 1, look at what happens. Now the Israelites, <coughs> excuse me, now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines, the Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel as the battle spread. Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. Okay, that's, they lost. Israel lost. Lost the battle and they lost 4,000 men. So what are they going to do about that? They don't want to lose. Look at verse 3. <coughs> Excuse me. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did Yahweh bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Do you realize the audacity of this? And we're going to discover in the next few weeks as they start to build the tabernacle in Exodus what the ark is. Because the whole tabernacle, later the temple, it represents the throne, the palace of God. And, and you have the holy of holies and you have the holy place. And, and that represents his throne room. In some way, it's an earthly representation of an eternal reality. And the Ark of the Covenant, pictured here, represents the throne of God. The Bible describes that the Lord is enthroned between the wings of the cherubim. It's a chair. It's a throne. And these guys, these soldiers, they don't ask permission. They don't ask God what to do with the Philistines. Instead, they just make up their own mind. And they barge into the tabernacle, past the priests, into the holy place, past all that. They go through the curtain into the Holy of Holies, which you think about the Holy of Holies, only one priest once a year could go in there, and it was such a respected place that they are entering the throne room of God, they tie a rope around the priest going in there once a year with bells on him, so that if the bells stopped, they knew that he died in the presence of, Lord and of the Lord, and they could drag his body out by the rope. That's how respected this place was. But they barge in there, through the curtain, grab the throne of God, God, lift it up and carry it out to the battle. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. Guess what they were doing? Misusing the name of God, the reputation of God for their own purposes. Look at verse 5 there in 1 Samuel 4. <clears throat> When the ark of Yahweh's covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Oh 
man, we can do things that are done in the name of the Lord that draw the crowd's approval. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of Yahweh who had come into the, it, it was the ark of Yahweh who had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. Oh no. Nothing like this has ever happened before. We are doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. It's working. Terror in the hearts of their enemies. The ark of uh, the reputation of God, it, it proceeds, you know, it, it's. In fact, it, they even refer back to what we're reading about in Exodus hundreds of years earlier that's still famous. A lot of times people can do things in the name of God that appear to be godly and bring God's power, but it has nothing to do with the Lord. It has only to do with our own purposes and building our little kingdoms. Verse 9 of 1 Samuel. Be strong. This is the Philistines talking to each other. They're freaked out. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you'll be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. But what's even worse, the ark of God was captured. Well, it looked like they were doing this in the name of the Lord, had nothing to do with that. They were misusing God's name. And the consequences were drastic. I mean, you think about this. If only one military leader or soldier or priest or someone would just have said, hey guys, check our heading. God gave them This compass, this moral compass, there is very real right and wrong. Not this, you know, there are absolute rights and wrong. We don't make it up like our culture tells us. No, God's standard doesn't change. God's standard is don't misuse the name of the Lord. Don't use it for your own purposes. And if somebody says, hey guys, check our heading. Let's see, we're heading this direction. God's standard is that direction. We need to stop. We need to stop and ask the Lord what to do, not just make our own plan. Instead, no, they don't do that. They they should have stopped and turned towards the Lord, but they don't. They just keep pushing through, do it their way, grab the ark of the Lord, and as a result, they lose 30,000 soldiers, which they could not afford to lose, and they lost the throne of God to their enemies. If you want to read a wild story, read the next couple chapters there in 1 Samuel about how God didn't need them. (laughs) He took care of himself. (laughs) Love it. Love it. But that's the thing. We need to regularly recalibrate our heading to make sure we're not going our direction. We're going God's direction. That we have no other gods before us. We have no idols. And that we're not misusing his name for our own purposes. Regularly recalibrate You're heading. Now, it's easy to see this in Israel or Hitler or in the Crusades, misusing the name of the Lord, but it's so much harder to see it in our own lives. But I'm telling you, it's more common than people using the name of God as a profanity because we are all expert kingdom builders. I've used this castle before. It's in my office so I can play with it anytime I want. Every single person in this room is constantly building a kingdom. The question is whose kingdom are you building? Most often we're building our own kingdom. Our kingdom, it's it's our world, what we're known for, who we live for, what we do. And all of us, and you know, 
guys, we have our flags that we're known for. I'm an athlete. You may not be today, but you used to be an athlete. I, if I live in Yamhill County, I have a truck. And I have the beastiest truck around. Definitely a Ford, not a Chevy. Monster. 10-inch lift. Big tires. Goes anywhere. Breaks down every day, but it goes anywhere. And I am a hunter. I am the great outdoorsman. I have a Cabela's card. In fact, I'm a prime member. Bass Pro Shops, camo, everything I own has camo. And I am the barbecue master, or I'm the smoker master. I got my Traeger. Man, you want to see this thing, man? I can smoke up some meat. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This is who I am. This is your kingdom. This is what you want to be known for. It's not just guys. Girls. You know what the most common thing girls want to be known for is? I am beautiful. Can I just say how tragic it is on social media when there's girls who are living by how many likes or comments about how cute or beautiful they are on social media? You know, every, every, it's like girls have become, every girl is a professional model now. They all have that model pose, right? It's like this, it's like, <laughs> I can't even do, I can't even do it. Like, yeah, I am not a model. <laughs> oh, you look so cute. Oh, you look so beautiful. It's, it's what you want to be known for. And you're tasteful. You've got the best taste in clothes. Your home is so beautifully decorated. It's wonderful. And your kids? Oh, yeah. My kids are perfect. So well behaved. Shut up! (laughs) So well behaved. You know, and this is what you want to be known for. It's this image we present to the world. But this image has nothing about Jesus or God. This image is about, about... Uh, You, your kingdom. Because the problem with this is there's always somebody better. Did you know that? You think you're beautiful, and you might be, but there's always somebody prettier. There's this girl, she's a model. And, And you think you're tasteful? Well, this girl, she's got a blog, an Instagram. She has 20,000 followers. She's tasteful. People want to know her opinion about how to do things. Oh, your home is great? Well, this girl's home was featured in Better's Homes and Gardens or or for the Street of Dreams. And your kids are great? Well, her kids, they're going to Harvard. There's always somebody better. And so what we do, and this is where I want to bring it to the third commandment about not misusing the name of the Lord, is do you realize how easy it is to use a walk with God to build your own little kingdom? Because, you know, a lot of times we don't compete very well with this stuff, so we're going to find something else to compete with. Yeah, I'm the Bible scholar. Oh, I know God's word. People come to me. They seek me out. It has nothing to do with loving God's word. You just love people lifting you up as a wise Bible scholar. You're, you're, you're full of wisdom. You're the person that people go to because you always have such good advice. You're, you are the prayer, prayer. <laughs> now people, she knows how to pray. He knows how to pray. Man, when... When they pray, they grab the, the, the throne of God and just hold on for dear life. The worshiper. This one is probably most common among people under 30 right now. There's a lot of addiction to worship that has very little to do with the Lord. They love, they're addicted to the worship experience. 
not necessarily seeking the Lord. And you know how we know this? By the fruit in their lives, how they are living according to the world or according to the Lord. But you look at this stuff, none of this stuff is bad. I want you all to be Bible scholars and wise, walking in wisdom, praying, seeking the Lord. I mean, prayer is so important around here. We have our prayer team Saturday night. We have, and prayer is so important. We want worship. We want de- deeper worship. These are all great things. But if these are what you're doing to build your reputation, it's disgusting. That's misusing the name of the Lord. I'm going to get real transparent with you. Because do you know and realize what a temptation this is for me as a pastor? I'll be real honest with you. It's a battle. Man, I want to be the great communicator. I want to communicate the Bible better than anybody. I want to be known as the the, the best communicator of Scripture. That's what I want to do. And you know what? It's about building my kingdom. I want to be the leader. I want to lead people to Jesus. Okay? But I also want people to know, man, he knows how to lead. You know, I want to be the strategist who knows all the great strategies, the latest strategies to do to build the church, read all the right books. I want to be the shepherd that shepherds people. And all these things are good things. But if I'm using these things to build my reputation, it's disgusting. So what I need to do is I need to take this compass that God has provided in the Ten Commandments. I need to find out what his standard is. Find out me and go, well, Brian, you're just building your own reputation, your own worth. Stop. Repent. Say, God, I am sorry. I need your strength to go your way to your standard, so that as I teach, as I lead, as I strategize, as I shepherd, I'm not just building it so that people can think I'm good at those things. I'm doing it because it's building the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Brian. This is what I want my life to point towards, so that when people see me teach, they say, you know what? That guy's building the kingdom of God, not his own kingdom. Do you know how many American churches are built upon someone building their own little kingdom? It's lead, shepherd, all these things. It's about God. Yes, I want you to be praying. Yes, I want you to study scripture. Yes, I want you to be full of wisdom. But constantly, for me, I have to check it all the time, every day. Get my heart right. That's why I'll spend time before I even start studying scripture just to Come before the Lord. God, where am I going? What am I doing here? Am I trying to impress people with my words? Well, I repent of that. God, would I just represent you and point people to your word and point people to your kingdom? That's your standard. I want my life to point to you. Does this make sense? That's what the third commandment is talking about. It's not just profanity. It's not just talking about the words. It's talking about misusing the name of God for your own selfish purposes. Don't do it. Regularly check your heading. Where did I put the compass? Regularly check your heading and recalibrate. Regularly recalibrate your heading. Look at all the way back to Exodus chapter 20. Go back there. Verse 8. Next one. We'll do this one fast. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And so here we go to the fourth heading. First was no other gods before me, no idols, which means addictions. Don't misuse the name of the Lord for yourself. And then remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. You know, it's interesting. This is the second time they've heard about a Sabbath. They hadn't heard about it before they were in the desert. And God taught them about what a Sabbath was. Sabbath just means cease from work or or rest. And God talked about Sabbath and he taught them what a Sabbath looked like with manna. Do you remember this back here, verse chapter 16? He said to them, this is what Yahweh commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath, of rest, ceasing from working. 
A holy Sabbath to Yahweh. So bake what you want to bake and boil and what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded. And it did not stink or, or get maggots in it. That's what happened if they gathered too much on other days. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to Yahweh. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not, there will not be any. This was, it was just an object lesson about work and rest and faith to a bunch of people. They were slaves who had just been freed. They had no idea how to have a day off. Did you know that? They didn't know how to rest. As slaves, they never had a regular day off in their entire lives. And so God had to teach them through this object lesson, manna. And, and now he's saying, okay, this is going to be a regular part of your lives. Look at verse 9. He tells them how it's going to happen. Six days, Exodus 20, verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day, that's Saturday, is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. You know, he, he made that day, that Saturday, that Sabbath holy, which we've learned doesn't mean religious. Holy just means set apart, separated, different. He's going to set that part of day, uh, that day away for them to rest in God's promise to provide based upon him, not based upon their efforts. You know, I can't help but think of Chick-fil-A at this point. You know, they, they don't take Saturday off. They take Sunday off, those stinking jerks. And it's pretty famous. It's not so much anymore. Chick-fil-A is definitely not what they used to be. But here they, they, they would only have six days that they were open, closed on Sunday so that people could go to church. And everybody, how foolish of a business decision. But what ended up happening is they ended up becoming the second largest fast food chain in America, <laughs> despite only working six out of seven days. Okay, so it's the same principle here. But here's the problem for us today. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Did you realize that? Saturday is still the Sabbath day. That didn't change. So here's the question. If we work on Saturdays, or if we're doing something that takes effort on Saturdays, I mean, Jews who still keep the Sabbath, they don't even turn on a light switch on Saturdays because that would be working. So are we making God mad every time we do something on Saturday? Is that the way it works? Well, not according to the New Testament. God didn't end the Sabbath. It's not like this commandment is not relevant to our lives anymore. We are still to keep a Sabbath rest. But it all changed at the cross. Because before the cross, once a week was the Sabbath. But after the cross, when Jesus came, died, rose again, he provided the rest that the Sabbath day pointed to. Hebrews talks about this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse, verse 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's not one day a week. There's a, there remains for anyone who enters God's rest, also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. What it's talking about in Hebrews chapter 4 is that it's not once a week that we Sabbath rest. It's all the time. 24-7, we enter the rest that the Sabbath day pointed towards. To rest that it's not up to us. It's up to him. And we enter the Sabbath rest every day, moment by moment, when we take this compass, this moral compass between right and wrong, we don't have our standards of right and wrong. We look to his standards. We look at where we're going, realize we're off, off kilter. We turn, repent, go back on his heading and realize it's not 
us working our way to him. We were provided a way to him and the power to live that way by what Jesus did on the cross. That's entering the Sabbath day rest. Every day is Sabbath. When we fully depend upon the Lord to provide, not earning our salvation, but resting in what Jesus did on our behalf. So here's the question. Are you trying to earn your way? You're like, no, no, I know we don't earn our way. Well, here's, here's a, a way to figure that out. Are you living in shame? Shame is, is like, you know, guilt is what we do. We, we're guilty when we sin. Shame is when guilt has run its course and it de defines who we are. There's a lot of you. A lot of us walking around with shame. And if that's you this morning, regularly recalibrate your heading. Remember the Sabbath. Remember the rest that results from his promise. And if you're feeling shame and you're just living with your past and past mistakes and regrets of what you've done, that's your heading it can define you. And what God is telling you to do this morning is to take that compass, take your heading, where's his standard? His standard said that he died, Jesus died on your behalf so you don't have to pay for your sins. He did it. You are a new creation. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Those are, that's the promise. So remember the Sabbath. Remember the promise. Change your heading. And live in that promise. Live in what Jesus did for you on the cross. And when the enemy reminds you of your shame, of your past, you say, nope, my righteousness is Jesus. And he gives me the power to live for him. And you grow closer and closer to him. That is the fourth commandment, the fourth heading. I'm going to have the band come on up here. But as they come up, I, I just have to point out something that was really easy to, to read past, but is really important. Look back at Exodus 20, verse 11. Look at what it says here. This is huge. This should be like explosions off the page, at how, how huge this is. Verse 11, for in six days, remember, well, for in six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Underline that. You know why? Two things we have to remember here. One is God was saying this. They were hearing this from God's voice thundering off the mountain saying, I created the heavens and the earth and the universe in six days. Because the second thing we have to realize here is they didn't know that. They didn't have the book of Genesis. Genesis. This is the first time they'd ever heard that. That this God who brought them out of Egypt, brought them to this mountain, said, you are my chosen nation to bring the Messiah, the Savior, into the world. I am the creator God who created the earth in six days. That was shocking. That he was powerful to create the universe in six days and rested on the seventh. And that's why we rest in his promise. first time they'd heard that but the message was true and the not so subtle message about who their God was and how precious this compass he was giving to them was that there is no other God before him to not seek idols or addictions to not misuse his name don't mess around with it for your own little kingdom and rest in the promises that he provides that same God is at work in your life today. That same compass he gave you as, a, as a, gave the Israelites as a gift, he offers you today. So check your heading regularly. God, where am I? Where am I going? Versus what is your standard? And we're going to see that acted out here. Because we're going to have a baptism right now. And Christian, come on up here. I don't know where I put the wirelesses. Do you have it? Come on up here. Christian has asked for Bryant and he's asked me to baptize him today. 
And we always give people the option, you know, who, who do you, who do you want to have baptize you? And so Christian, come on over here. We want to make sure Christian's about to move. Come on down here. You, you can have a seat. Christian's about to move. Actually, Brian, I'm going to go on that side. You go on this side. You're prettier than I am. And the light's on this side. Sure, sure. But I'm going to have Bryant go ahead. And we want to make sure he's baptized before Bryant um, leaves here at the end of December and also before you leave in January as well, Christian. But uh, why don't you go ahead and take over? Sure. So like Brian mentioned, uh, Christian's been hanging out with us for a little while, just a few months. But God's been doing an amazing work in his life. And I'm just, I've been looking forward to this opportunity to baptize him for a while now. He's already moved down to Eugene, but he drove all the way back up here uh, to be baptized. But Christian, I have a couple questions for you. I'm sure that they'd like to hear. Uh, tell me about when you accepted Jesus as your Savior. It was about two months ago. Um, I was reading the Bible and I was asking God, you know, how can I be saved? And uh, I opened up to a book called Peace and Real Answers. And uh, towards the end of the uh, of the book, it said, uh, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your whole heart that Jesus died for all our sins and he's the Lord, then you will be saved. And that's what I did. I went downstairs to my mom and I told her Jesus is my Lord and he's our savior and he died for us and rose again on the third day. And, and she looked at me and I just saw her. She said, okay, like, you know, you, you did it. So, yeah. That's really awesome, man. Don't you guys love that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christian, why don't you tell us why you want to get baptized today? So just like God does what he does for us, he seals us. This is my gift to God. I believe that this is what I want to give to God, my commitment to God and, and to uh, seal myself to God and uh, follow him for the rest of my life. All right. That's great. Uh, Brian has a couple words to say as well. Yeah, the important thing to remember about baptism is baptism doesn't save you. We've talked about this. It's just a drama. It's a drama written by God. This is act one as he's sitting here in the semi-warm water. We didn't get it fully heated this week. He's sitting here, he's nervous. This is act one. Act two is when he is crucified with Christ and, and is buried with Christ. And then act three is when he comes out. The old person dies and the new person comes out. And so he's going to act this out for you in this drama today. I got it. Well, Christian, uh, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.